very, very delighted to see you all today. And good evening to those of you who are watching online from wherever you may be around the world or in posterity because we are filming tonight and this, will, this one is going to run and run. So in the future, welcome to you as well. Um, we, are, like the rest of the world, are, of course, celebrating 100 years of James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, and there's no better way to do that with uh, two of Ireland's finest contemporary writers, Anne Enright and Ema McBride. And we're also delighted to welcome Dr Claire Hutton, who will be hosting them this evening. Um, the British Library has a small but very wonderful collection of Joyce uh, materials, and we're particularly indebted to Harriet Shaw Weaver, the uh, patron of James Joyce, who uh, gave her archive all possibly sold it, I'm not totally sure, um, uh, to the British Library uh, a, a while ago. And some of those materials and others are on display in the Treasures Gallery of the British Library at the moment, including some incredible notes on the making of Ulysses from Joyce himself, and some letters and first editions and so forth. So it's open for another few more days, in fact, so do get a chance to look at that if you can. Um, uh, Dr Claire Hutton uh, gave a wonderful talk on, on Harriet Shaw Weaver for us not so long ago, and she uh, delved into the collections, and that will be available on the British Library player shortly. Um, Claire is a reader in digital humanities at the, and English at the University of Loughborough. She has uh, recently curated the exhibition Women and the Making of Ulysses at the uh, um, Harry Ransom Center, University of Texas. And, and she's the author of um, Serial Encounters, Ulysses and the Little Review, and editor of the Irish Book in English. Um, we do have books by Anne and Ema and, of course, James himself outside. And the edition of Ulysses you find out there has, has got a fantastic new introduction by Anne. Um, later on, you'll be able to buy books, in fact. You'll have a copy of uh, one of each of, of Anne and Ema's two. So uh, those of you who are watching online can go to the Books tab at the top of the screen and you can also purchase if you wish. Um, later on, we'll be having questions in the normal way for you here. Put your hand up and wait for the mic. Those of you are watching online, you are able to post questions in the form below your video window, and we'll get to as many questions as we can later on. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention that uh, we are hosting a, f a number of events related to Ireland. We're trying to re re reinvigorate the British Library's relationship with, <laughs> with Ireland and institutions during the course of this year. And in the autumn, we are hosting a fantastic Irish Writers' Weekend, uh, so please look out for that, amongst other things. So uh, I'd like to now hand you over to Claire, to Emma, and to Anne, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, and um, I'd like to say welcome to the library. Um, what an unusual event this actually is. Um, unusual to be live after two very long years. Um, unusual um, to actually have two major novelists here to talk about another novel a hundred years on. There aren't many novels that we would talk about 100 years on. If we think about it, it's a very sort of interesting thing that Ulysses is still casting this spell 100 years later. Um, so let me introduce our novelists, Anne Enright, um, born in Dublin, where she now lives and works, um, the author of seven novels, including uh, The Gathering, which won the Booker Prize in 2007, and most recently, Actress, which came out just before lockdown, February 2020. Um, I remember seeing it on the, the best-selling shelves just there. That was the last time I was in Dublin. Um, and has also, um, this year, for the centenary of Ulysses, edited the um, vintage Ulysses, which you're holding in your hand, I can see. And um, also, um, it's a lovely edition, actually. I've just had a look, and I, my uh, inner joy... I, I think it was Hans Walter Gabler who edited it, actually. Yes, well, I mean, <laughs> but, but I just introduced, gave, yes. I just gave it a little freshener at the top. <laughs> no. I did immediately see it was Gabler's text. <laughs> I did notice that. My, I, I'm not here as an academic, but I did see that. <laughs> um, and also, Emer, um, so uh, astonishing book, um, A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, came out in 
2013 with its own unique um, publishing history. It took nine years to get to publication, but then won so many awards that year. Um, the Goldsmiths Prize and also the uh, Women's Prize for Fiction and also the Irish Novel of the Year. And since then we've had The Lesser Bohemians and um, most recently um, Strange Hotel, which also came out in February 2020. <laughs> also seems like a very long time ago now. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Um, the legacy of Ulysses. Um, where do we begin? Um, I thought a good place to begin would be to talk about first experiences of reading. When, where, why, how did you first encounter this book which continues to cast this spell? Over to you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> she said. Well, uh, uh, as I've been uh, writing over and over in the last six months, I, I bought my first copy of Ulysses when I was 14 in a bookshop in Kinsale when I was on a hosteling holiday. And so I read it in the hostel in Kinsale on the table. On the table in and then, it, for, for, then again in Cork, after we cycled to Cork. Um, and I still have the, that volume at home, actually. So it was 1977, and it cost 4.70. You can still see the sticker at the back. And I have no real idea of what I was doing when I bought Ulysses. It's a heavy book if you're cycling. <laughs> um, except I think I, I, I thought it would make me look interesting, of course. I was out in the world, and uh, I thought it would be a great draw. <laughs> uh, and... Um, <laughs> So, but I, I, I read maybe the first three episodes before I got back home and they were all kind of conniptions and lots of squawking from my mother who didn't want me to be reading Ulysses, thought I should be reading Dubliners. My sister was dispatched to talk to my English teacher who said that no, it was too early, too early. It, I, I, but you know, real teenage uh, ding dong because it was my money. And, I, <laughs> and so uh, it was agreed that it would be put up in the attic uh, until I was 18. And so it, it's, there was string and newspaper involved and the, it went up into the attic and I climbed up there when I was 18 and I read it while I was at college, uh, from all of it uh, at that stage. But I didn't study it until last year, put it that way. I didn't study it at college. So many people encounter it at university and it really, oop. I just, you know, looked at it and thought that was enough for the time being. Um, and I didn't want to go into all the stuff I didn't know, I wanted to experience it as directly as I could, and I, 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 it was it was m sort of my eyes on the page where all that interested me in in those in those early encounters, which was completely arrogant, and very a lot of fun. I have to say, I think resisting the temptation to study the book is quite sensible, actually. Just looking at it. That strikes me as quite a Yes, wise. I mean, you see some people, see some young people, it's a great book to read when you're young, but you want to grab the guide out of their hands and say, just, you know, <laughs> throw, throw them in at the deep end and see if they can swim. Yeah, I think so. What about you, Emer? You had an intense encounter on this book with the train. Yeah, this yeah. is the, like my foundational writing story, which is... Uh, I'm sure he'd be very pleased at that. But, uh, you know, I was older. I was 25. Mm. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so I was about 25 uh, when I read it. And I was uh, working as a temp. And I got this new temp job uh, doing data entry at Deutsche Bank <laughs> down on London Wall. And I just, I needed the job because, you know, I had to pay the rent. But also it was going to kill me a bit to have to go and do data entry at Deutsche Bank. Uh, so I thought, well, what can I do to make it better? I'll buy, I'll read Ulysses. And I'd ha I had it, I'd bought it when I was about 18, 19, and I had maybe started it, but I hadn't really read it. And I bought it, this copy, in fact, and I still have the original bookmark, which is from a bookshop in Westport. Wow. Um, and so I thought, right, I, I'll, this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll read Ulysses, that will make it all better. It'll, 
me Deutsche Bank recede. And so at the time I was living in Tottenham and I had to get the train in from Bruce Grove to Liverpool Street every day, and which was about 20 minutes. And so I got on and I started to read it and it was a complete Joyce and epiphany. And by the time I got off, I just thought, oh, right. <laughs> Everything that I have written up until this point is rubbish and it's time to start again. This is, if this can be done, then this is the direction that I was going to go in. train underground or overground? It was overground. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I, you're going to be emerging then. Yeah. It's no, it's sadly yeah. not quite as cinematic as that. Yeah. It's just more kind of stumbling through the crowds, but yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was my, my kind of beginning of, of Joyce. And then, and then, yeah, it was just reading it over that period where I would go and sit in Finsbury Circus, which is now all built over, and just kind of eat my curly cheese sandwich and read Ulysses or read it on my lap while I was doing my data entry. And uh, yeah, it did help actually. So, you know. People have been telling me stories about, you know, I was at college, it was just after a breakup, I was so sad, I sat and I read Ulysses. People tell me some origin story about the book, which is, you know, which is about growing up or enlargement, and it's quite poignant sometimes, it's interesting, mm. that, you know, that they set it as a thing that will shift something in their, in their lives, that they're going to do this now, and that, that, that the moment of choice can be kind of slightly melancholic, which I like. Well, it's that thing, I think it connects to that thing where people are so, so often just say to you, oh, I've never read it, oh, I couldn't read it. And so when people do read it, they're never sorry that they read it, even if they have to suffer through it. And so by the time they get to the end, the beginning of that journey is yeah. kind of a thing. Because it's just, I mean, it's so often you meet people who just go, oh, no, pff, never read it, couldn't read it started it. It was terrible. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, it started it. <laughs> but uh, they did a survey on some Irish website and there were, you know, 5,000 people said, responded to it and 3,000, uh, two out of, maybe one out of, sorry, 3,000 said they'd read it and 2,000 said they hadn't finished it. So tick for not finishing it. Which is quite, quite good, you know. Um, I mean, I'm strongly of the opinion that whether you finish it or not is, is, is a matter of your own self-importance, really. It doesn't really matter if you finish the book. Just read the, you know, I mean, who finishes Ulysses? And, and that even when you've finished it, it won't remain, it won't stop just because you've stopped. It will keep going behind your back. And then you go back to it. You'll find that you have to start it all over again, somehow. I, I, I actually, that's not, I mean, yeah, I'm just I'm just making that up. But, <laughs> uh, but 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 the idea of finishing it or not finishing it of of it as a of a, it as something possessed and and done and completed is 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 not something that I I value. Put it that way. I'm very happy for people to read in it or read it one way or the other. I like the modesty of these responses. I like the idea that, you know, you can read it for 20 minutes on the train. You know, I like that. That's, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, just to kind of settle in for 20 minutes and give it a go. But, but you, I mean, if people say, how did you read Ulysses at 14? The, the other way to read Ulysses is one word at a time. Yeah. Uh, which is n not as stupid an answer as it sounds. Um, I like it, it was Kenner saying that the sentence is not the privileged sort of unit in choice, that a lot of the excitement is one word at a time. The sentences tend to fall apart under you. So, um, so that's not a, not a bad way to, 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 to proceed. Mm. One word at a time and sometimes one paragraph with one word. I mean, he's the genius of the one word paragraph. That's one of his kind of tricks, which is an amazing thing to be able to have that confidence to write a, a one word. There's lots of it's tricks and confidence. You've got a big Joyce that everyone also goes behind the book to, to think about what Joyce is trying to do to their head. 
Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of sort of biological interest as you slide through the text and say, "This is very tricksy." Now, I'm not, I'm not putting it up to you, but do you know what I mean? That that who has the confidence to do that? He was supreme. I suppose he was supremely confident, but but I think it's also important it really to remember, well. like he didn't, he wasn't writing in the light of James Joyce. Yes. He wasn't. He wasn't writing with the weight of oh, this is what I have to do, and this is the, takes confidence, and this uh, here I am. I think for everyone going after, there's the weight of oh, well, he had the confidence to write a one-word paragraph, but for himself, it was all virgin. It was all his own. Yeah, it was whether it worked or not. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And he yeah. didn't know for a long time. I mean, I know he gave a lot of lather about it, but. Nobody, like no writer knows whether they have succeeded or not as they go along. Uh, yeah, interesting. I think, I think he, George was very knowing. I think he own. knew. I think I he, think he gave, No, I think there's a lot of bluster and I think there's a, a lot of confidence. But I think there's also, there's so much writing that he's hiding all his fear inside. Yeah, there's writing. a lot of hiding, all right. Yeah, yeah come and get me. Yeah. Uh, which is the other kind of, uh, the reverse of what you're saying, that he's saying, I'm in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, putting it up to you. Yeah. But I like that Nora saying he's up all night writing, laughing to himself. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. that, that that kind of, that, jo that, that pleasure is that, you know, the yeah. sense that he's having a good time is enough for me sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Well, now, um, what about some readings to reflect on this, to kind of, otherwise we might go around in circles here. Well, we will go around in circles, but why don't we just um, open the book and have a, a sense of, you know, you as readers oh. would be nice. Um, who's going to go first? I think mine is at the earlier your, part Your of the chapter book. one. Yeah, I'm chapter yeah. one. Uh, so this is uh, at the top of the Joyce Tower, the Martello Tower in Sandy Grove, uh, and it's Buck Mulligan. Ah, shaving, looking out over the sea. God, he said quietly. Isn't the sea what Algy calls it? A great, sweet mother. The snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea. Epi onoipa ponton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks. I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalatha, Thalatha. She is our great, sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat, clearing the harbour mouth at Kingst of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his grey, searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You couldn't have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There's something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly, his farther cheek, a tolerant smile, curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he murmured to himself, Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave cloths giving off an odour of wax and rosewood, wood, her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odour of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge, he saw the ha sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few no nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. A well-fed voice. Yeah, so it's it's too famous to read. 
the wet ashes and the rosewood and all the whole thing. It's too famous to read. It's not really. I mean, the well-fed voice and our poor dog's body. Mm. It's amazing. The, the, the way he squashes those words together. Yes. That's it's not the, great scrotum tightening, all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, that's great. But I, what I, I, he makes Buck Mulligan, when, I love Joyce writing this extremely offensive book, makes Buck Mulligan the most offensive character in it. Yeah. And Stephen is kind of pious and Jesuitical. You fearful Jesuit, he's called, and disapproving, and takes offense. Buck Mulligan sails around the place, you know, uh, saying dreadful things. Uh, and it was just another Joyce's tricks. I'm not saying it. It's, it's, it uh, even when they, they, they accuse each other of pissing on Singh's door. Mm. That was his contribution to the cause of literature, I think. <laughs> Me, says Stephen, no, that was his contribution. Um, so that it, uh, Buck, Buck Mulligan takes the slack, or takes the blame. We can come back to the, the doorway where... Uh, you know, there's steps up to that door. Yeah. You don't, you don't just idly come back from the pub and relieve yourself over the wall and hit the door. You have to go up a big set of granite steps where J.M. Singh was living with his elderly mother. Yeah. And you have to do it. Yeah, it's really, it takes it. some doing. You have to This is it. obviously yeah. something, yeah. yeah. This door is when you visit it. We'll come back to But I, Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's a stupid thing where, where, where Joyce was so drunk he fell down and pissed himself outside a reading of, Joy, of Singh's work. Mm. And so he takes this really abject and horrible um, episode of his own life and turns it into Buck Mulligan and mm. all that. Amazing. Sorry, Amazing. it's very hard to stick to the one subject here. It's, we'll come back to glass stool and doorways um, and, you know, the intimacy of living in Dublin with these kind of monumental yeah. textual presences. Um, but maybe we could move to you for a reading, would you like to? Yeah, I'm reading for a bit later on and I, I'm trying to remember why I chose this bit. I think uh, it was kind of nosiness, the nosiness that he has about women that made me read it, take it. But anyway... I'll read it and we'll see. Ah, devils they are when that's coming on them. Dark, devilish appearance. Molly often told me, feel things a ton weight. Scratch the sole of my foot. Oh, that way. Oh, that's exquisite. I feel it myself too. Good to rest once in a way. Wonder if it's bad to go with them then. Safe in one way. Turns milk, makes fiddle strings snap. Something about withering plants I read in a garden. Besides, they say at the flower withers she wears, she's a flirt. All are, dare say, she felt I. When you feel like that, you often meet what you feel. Like me or what? Dress, they look at. Always know a fellow courting collars and cuffs. Well, cocks and lions do the same and stags. Same time might prefer a tie undone or something. Trousers. Suppose I, when I was, no, gently does it. Dislike rough and tumble, kiss in the dark and never tell. Saw something in me, wonder what. Sooner have me as I am than some poet chap with bare grease, plastery hair, love lock over his dexter optic. <laughs> to aid gentlemen in literary. Ought to attend to my appearance my age. Didn't let her see me in profile. Still, you never know. Pretty girls and ugly men, Marion, Beauty and the Beast. Besides, I can't be so if Molly took off her hat to show her hair. Wide brim, bought to hide her face. Meeting someone might know her. Bend down her, carry a bunch of flowers to smell. Hair strong and rut. Ten bob I got for Molly's combings when we were on the rocks in Hollis Street. Why not? Suppose he gave her money. Why not? All a prejudice. She's worth 10, 15, more, <laughs> a pound. <laughs> what? I think so. All that for nothing. Bold hand, Mrs. Marion. Did I forget to write an address on that letter like the postcard I sent to Flynn? And the day I went to Drimmy's without a necktie, wrangle with Molly it was, put me off. No, I remember Richie Goulding. Heck, he's another. Weighs on his mind. Funny, my watch stopped at half past four. Dust. Shark liver oil I used to clean. Could do it myself. Save. 
Was that just when he, she? Oh, he did. Into her. She did. Done. Ah. <laughs> well, follow that. Um, inside the head of Leopold Bloom. I think that's the only reference to penetrative sex in the book. Into her. No, I'm oh, not no, going to not 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 challenge you on that. Um, sorry. There's... Sorry, no. Yeah, stay offline, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop, there is, there is. <laughs> I didn't mean it. Um, so, I mean, it's just, we're into the question of, you know, um, Bloom and interior monologue and the stream of consciousness and the, the very distinctive styles of I mean what's interesting about bloom and stream of consciousness is how it changes as the the moods of the day progress you know the mo moods and moments um, so that you don't just get one type of narrative it's it's many types um, so I suppose the question really would be you know the correlation between coming to terms with the book as a reader and committing to your own novel writing? That's quite a big question, isn't it? So in other words, what has Ulysses enabled? Oh, well, for me, I mean, pretty much everything, I would say. <laughs> I, think, um, I think because I came to it with such ignorance, without any reverence or understanding, yeah. with no kind of university education or sense of don't you point know, at me. Approach. I'm, I'm really <laughs> clawing the air rather than pointing. But um, I, I think it gave me freedom yeah. that um, I don't know. I suppose for a long time it was felt that he ruined it for everyone. But for me, yeah. because I came to it with ignorance, it was mm, a release from all the kind of 19th century stuff that I had been wading through before that. And I think to be allowed to give free reign to whatever mm. came to your mind, to follow, in a way, he, he, although it's such a constructed novel, there's also a sense constantly of instinct, of, of just, of, of the brain darting here and there and following and finding mm images, finding words, finding styles and forms, um, which interested me less that, I don't know where I've gone off, but um, uh, it, yeah, it, it was that boundlessness, I think, mm. of possibility for the novel that was something I had not encountered before and that's mm. um, always stayed with me whenever I mm. uh, get stuck. So it's a sort of liberating force for your own aesthetic growth. Yeah, I think so. Of just being kind of unconcerned with anything other than your own whim. Yeah. And I think that's a very important thing to not feel constrained by rules or forms or ways of, of doing or writing or behaving. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, that was Joyce allowed that and that was maybe because I had come from this very particular kind of reading that was very sort of 19th century uh, and to just suddenly feel on the outside of that to be kind of pushed towards and pushed towards um, writing for the body that had to be that language had to be changed in order to capture to be free to find a new language to describe the kind of experiences we have that grammatical language isn't quite so adequate to describe, to, find, to just find the gaps between words and try and find, create something that you could push into that, that pulls the sense mm. of that experience out. And, and that's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do because the experience is so subjective, but when you see Joyce do it, and even if you don't always agree, kind of gives you, I think, a bit of courage to have a go, it did for me. I suppose one of the things you're talking about is memory and the way that, you know, Joyce's prose remembers so many things. 
and you know how he you know he's so confident well i love his kind of shameless obsessiveness I, yeah. I love the endless lists, the endless hilarious lists of, you know, people's names and uh, places or types of food that just, that he twists and plays with. Yeah. And that, that kind of thing, which is, you know that he's pulling all of these things into a place where he wants to keep them safe in the world. And he's taking them out of the realm of memory where once he's gone, they will be gone. <laughs> and my feeling is that he, he puts them all in here so that he himself is preserved. Mm. And, and that's, you know, it's kind of shamelessly arrogant thing to do, think that anyone would be interested, but also it's an obsessive thing to do, which exists outside audience. Um, and, I, and I quite like that, to be able mm. to sort of give in to your own obsessions um, and, and then just let them go free in the world and see what comes back from them. Yeah, that's one of the phrases in the criticism. Is it Jung or someone says about Joyce, he has no concern with audiences? I think yeah, it's which kind is of interesting. The, you know, I think yeah, Jung thought he was cold as well. Jung also thought he was cold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but I don't know. Oh, and yeah, and I know Joyce, <laughs> Joyce was very offended by Young, wasn't he? And that was yeah. why it was such a big deal that he allowed him to treat Lucia. But he, yeah, he's, he's not the only one who thought it was cold. I mean, uh, but uh, uh, the temperature never bothered me. <laughs> it was no, never. It doesn't, I, don't, I don't think it's cold either. I don't agree. I think. Sort I of think body he, heat. Yeah. I think he <laughs> it's of, like 30. There are too point. many functions, there are too yeah, many yeah. missions. There are two, you know, it's, I, there is no distance with Joyce. Yeah. You're, you're, you're so pushed it's, right it's up against the experience Blood, blood temperature, the yeah. yeah. So can I just return back to this question to you, Anne? I mean, what about that correlation between reading and writing for you? Did yeah. you feel as though technique, style, theme? I don't think, I, 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 I wasn't Joyce, uh, I didn't suffer anxiety uh, about Joyce's influence because I never claimed it as an influence. Um, but it's, you, you know, when you've, been reading, when you've been around a book most of your life, it's like you wouldn't claim Yeats as an influence, but I've been reading Yeats since I was eight, you know, so when, it's like, what do you, what, 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 so, so it's somehow part, so not quite of my DNA, but it's, part of my epigenetics, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it, it, it's somehow visceral or it's in the way I am as an Irish writer. So I'm not going to kind of, uh, um, I, I, and I, you know, I, I'm developing a theory that some writers are, are not as good as the Joyce of Dubliners. And then some writers are not as good as the Joyce of Portrait of the Artist. <laughs> some writers are not as, that, not in Emer's case, not as, <laughs> uh, take Ulysses as their, as their cue. Um, and I think that I've found the, the stuff in Portrait, in retrospect, the way the text kind of organizes itself into different styles in the Hellfire Sermon or in the stuff about romance and romantic fiction. And he does the same in a, on a, a larger scale in Ulysses. So it allows you episode to episode to, for, the, for the language to become the, the, the style that it needs to be for that length of time uh, until it almost becomes redundantly stylish, if you know what I mean, or redundant in its own. Uh, so that, that, that's pre post, the, well, it, I don't know. I don't know if, enough about modernism to say that that's what modernism gives to you is the ability to kind of uh, find different idioms within a single story, which I like to do. I like my characters to think differently, but I'd like sometimes for them to think like different books, like they're in a different book mm. already, uh, which I did a bit in The Green Road and I'm doing it again now. And uh, so, yeah, but that's not a very good question. That's not a very good answer. A lot, a lot of writers say, how can you write in the shadow of Joyce? And, and like Emer, I say, he just, he, he, he shone a great light. He made all things possible. So it's whatever you're having yourself. There's, there it is. Yeah. It's all there. Yeah. So you can, you know, it's, it's available. It made, it made many things available. 
I think also it's an easier question for novelists than it is for academics because I, I think often academics, when they talk about influence, they want to see something very directly, a very direct link inside work. Whereas I think for novelists, an idea of influence is not a recreation or a repetition. It's about something that opens a place inside you that allows you then to go on and do your own thing. Mm. And that's and so I think there's there's two kind of conversations about influence. Mm. But um, also if you've read Ulysses and, and people sometimes say to me, you write a lot about the body and you say, well, what else are you living in, right? If you're not <laughs> living in a body, I'd love to write about, you know, garden sheds or something, but we're not all walking around as garden sheds, you know. Um, uh, and, and, and there are things that he does that when people don't do it, you say, well, wh how can you abandon that whole sort of uh, part of, 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 of uh, you know, the writing life? Or, the, or you know, how can, you, how can you not write about the body? How can you not uh, allow language to do its thing? How can you, can you keep it, keep, how can you keep it closed down like that? Or one way or the other? I was really struck, I was looking at your um, introduction. Um, I know you've written several pieces. This, this one where you talk about the, um, the freedom Joyce brought to the Irish tradition has been more useful to female writers than to male. Welcomed as a gift um, by writers like Emer, like Edna O'Brien. Yeah. Um, and then the killer line in that, essay when you just say his innovative genius is more often declared a burden by men that's sort of it's sort of straight into this yeah well period. it's all old father old artificer stuff yeah and I'm, I'm really intrigued about how people go through the text to the person behind the text and take the person behind the text on as if there was some mano a mano going on Mm. That you have to beat Joyce by reading him, yeah, uh, or not allow yourself be beaten by Joyce, you know. So or possess whatever it is that he possessed. But what he's doing in the page is he's very energetically, uh, you know, <laughs> he's messing with language. Mm. Um, he's he, he, he uh, 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 it's it's not about him finally. Mm. Or it can't be about him because Emer says he hides, but he disappears behind it all. Or he becomes redundant and the book becomes its own thing. Yes, we shouldn't be so interested in the, the, the kind of self projected by the writing. We should be just interested in the writing. But we should also not necessarily assume that the writer is projecting. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of one of the problems with a lot of modern reading is that everything, and obviously, a lot of women get this more than male writers. That if you're writing a character who is a woman and you are a woman, then this character is somehow a projection of you. Yes, right. And then it's applying that logic to Joyce as well. And I think. But it rather wonderfully can't be not you. Yeah, but not necessarily it, the way I mean, people think. No, not the way people think. So, the, the, and the, the incredible richness that he could yeah, yeah. then, uh, all the not Joyce's in the book, I mean, Stephen and Bloom. It's so enlarging. Um, I just wonder if we should get on to some more readings um, and maybe think about this sort of business of luxuriating in the language of the novel. I know you've got the dog, Tatters. I'll take the dog, that. will I? You mongrel. Um, it's, good. it's good reading. It's a good dog. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he, you know, he can do anything. He's just showing off. He just does descriptive. He just does it. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, Stephen on Sandy Mount Strand, which is this amazing, shallow, beach in Dublin that goes on to the horizon when the tide is out and then the sea comes right up to the wall as it chases Stephen off uh, at, at, in the middle of this chapter towards the end of it. Cockle pickers. They waded a little way in the water and stooping soused their bags and lifted them again, lifting them again waded out. The dog yelped running to them, reared up and pawed them, dropped on all fours again, reared up at them at mute bearish fawning. 
Unheeded, he kept by them as they came towards the drier sand, a rag of wolf's tongue red panting from his jaws. His speckled body ambled ahead of them and then loped off at a calf's gallop. The carcass lay in his path. He stopped, sniffed, stalked around it. Brother, nosing closer, went round it, sniffing rapidly like a dog all over the dead dog's bedraggled fell. Dog skull, dog sniff, eyes on the ground, moves to one great goal. Ah, poor dog's body. Here lies poor dog's body's body. Tatters out of that, you mongrel. <laughs> the cry brought him skulking back to his master and a blunt bootless kick sent him unscathed across a spit of sand, crouched in flight. He slunk back in a curve, doesn't see me. Along by the edge of the mole, he lolloped, dawdled, smelt a rock, and from under a cocked hind leg, pissed against it. He trotted forward, and lifting again his hind leg, piss, pissed quick short at an unsmelt rock. The simple pleasures of the poor. <laughs> his hind paws then scattered the sand, then his four paws, paw, four paws dabbled and delved, something he buried there, his grandmother. He rooted in the sand, dabbling, delving, and stopped to listen to the air, scraped up the sand again with the fury of his claws, soon ceasing. A pard, a panther, got in spouse breach, vulturing the dead. Fantastic. Just one out of many metamorphoses, apparently, in that chapter. The dog becomes another thing, and another <laughs> thing, and another thing. And the language, that's what Emer's language does. So <laughs> it sort of nouns, it's <coughs> verbs. Verbs, it's nouns, and gerundifies everything. The bit that strikes me is the um, the absolute kind of Dublinese of the way the dog is called. Get tatters. tatters out of that, you mongrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, like yeah. A, it's a shock, you know. The get out of that. I think Simon Dedalus does a get out of that later on. Yeah. In one, one go. Get out of that now. Yeah. You can hear those voices. You can hear those voices. All the, you know, the, 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 you know, I mean, they talk about the streets and the places and the times and everything, but the absolute accuracy uh, of, to the uh, to the Dublin idiom, so much of which remains the same, is kind of mm. astonishing. And it's so amazing that you know Joyce wrote that detail with such an absolute ear, so precisely never having gone back after 1912. I mean, yeah. this 260,000 word novel is written in these circumstances of kind of chaotic upheaval. Yeah, it shades into the parodic very quickly, uh, uh, which may have helped, if you know what I mean, he's, yeah. he's doing the voices. Um, and, and then the, the, the voices themselves are quite parodic. There's quite a playfulness mm -hmm. about the kind of uh, speech that particularly the men in the book use. They're always larging it. Um, and they're always, they, they're having the bants, you know? They're bantering. Yep. Um, and so there's quite a performative thing to it, which mm -hmm. you can see. It's, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, people never not doing Monty Python and the Holy Grail as they grow older. You can see mm -hmm. that somebody would hold on to that kind of dramatic, uh, the dramatic potential of that and have it in their head as a kind of constant thing. Um, well, don't you think it's also about the, his being away that allowed him to sink so far down into the memory of the Dublin that he has left behind, that it, in a way that had he been there, that kind of concentration would have been dispersed by everyday life, by actual interactions with people and the city on the current basis. And that actually having that space away, that place, and that, and the, the kind of the endless letters of what is that shop still there and where was yeah, then, yeah. was kind of, it's, it's the memorial again, I think it's kind of the obsessive memorial, but it's the, he kind of luxury, he allows himself to luxuriate in a Dublin that he's, is already gone because he is, and he can do it because he's not being interfered with 
by contemporary Dublin. And, and didn't, actually doesn't also quite exist. I mean, he, he, he at the, even at the time, <laughs> even, you know, he got lots of little things wrong, I, even in his absolute yeah. need for accuracy. He, some of the sources were quite corrupt and botched, and so he, yeah. he gets things he gets things slightly wrong. So he's it's half made up at the same time. When you mentioned um, big male voices, but I think you've got a big female voice to read. Mrs. Yelverton Barry. Oh, so yeah, I'm going to read a bit from Circe, so God help us all, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a long bit, so good luck. Uh, from, yeah, so Mrs. Yelverton Barry. <clears throat> In low corsaged opal ball dress and elbow length ivory gloves, wearing a sable trimmed brick, qu brick quilted dolman, a comb of brilliance, and panache of osprey in her hair. Arrest him, constable. He wrote me an anonymous letter in Prentice backhand when my husband was in the north riding of Tipperary on the Munster circuit, signed James Lovebirch. He said he had, been, he had seen from the gods my peerless globes as I sat in a box of the Theatre Royal at a command performance of La Cigal. I deeply inflamed him, he said. He made improper overtures to me to misconduct myself at half past four on the following Thursday, Dunsink time. He offered to send me through the post a work of fiction by Monsieur Paul de Kock entitled The Girl with the Three Pairs of Stays. Mrs. Bellingham, in cap and seal coney mantle, wrapped up in the <clears throat> wrapped up to the nose, steps out of her broom and scans through the tortoiseshell quizzing glasses she takes from inside her huge opossum muff. Also to me, yes, I believe it is the same objectionable person because he closed my carriage door outside Thornley Stokers one sleety day during the cold snap of February 1903, when even the grid of the waste pipe and ball stop in my bath cistern were frozen. Subsequently, he enclosed a bloom of Edelweiss culled on the heights, as he said, in my honour. I had it examined by a botanical expert and elicited the information that it was a blossom of the homegrown potato plant purloined <laughs> from a forcing case at the model farm. Mrs. Yelverton Barry, shame on him. A crowd of sluts and ragamuffins surges forward, the sluts and ragamuffins screaming, stop thief, hurrah, there, Bluebeard, three cheers for Ikey Mo. Second watch produces handcuffs. Here are the Darbys, Mrs. Bellingham. He addressed me in several handwritings with fulsome compliments, as a Venus in furs, an alleged profound pity for my frostbound coachman, Palmer, while in the same breath he expressed himself as envious of his ear flaps and fleecy sheepskins, and of his fortunate proximity to my person when standing behind my chair wearing my livery and the armorial bearings of the Bellingham escutcheon garnished sable, a buck's head coop or he lauded almost extravagantly my nether extremities, my swelling calves in silk hose drawn up to the limit, and eulogised glowingly on my other hidden treasures in priceless lace, which he said he could conjure up. He urged me, stating that he felt it his mission in life to urge me to defile the marriage bed, to commit adultery at the earliest possible opportunity. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Tolboys, in Amazon costume, hard hat, jack boots, cockspur, vermilion waistcoat, fawn musketeer gauntlets with braided drums, long train held up, and hunting crop with which she strikes her welt constantly. Also me, because he saw me on the polo grounds of the Phoenix Park <laughs> at the match all Ireland versus the rest of Ireland. My eyes, I know, shone divinely as I watched Captain Slogger Dennehy of the Inniskillings win the final chucker on his darling cob centaur. This plebeian Don Juan observed me from behind a hackney car and sent me in double envelopes an obscene photograph. Such as are sold after dark on Paris boulevards, insulting to any lady, I have it still. It represents a partially nude senorita, frail and lovely, his wife, as he solemnly assured me, taken by him from nature. Practicing, 
illicit intercourse with a muscular torero, evidently a blackguard. He urged me to do likewise, to misbehave, to sin with officers of the garrison. He implored me to soil his letter in an unspeakable manner, to chastise him as he richly deserves, to bestride him and ride him, to give him a most vicious horse whipping. Mrs. Bellingham, me too, Mrs. Yelverton Barry, me too. Several highly respectable Dublin ladies hold up improper letters received from Bloom, the Honourable Mrs. Tolbo, Tol, Ms. Mervyn Talbots, stamps her jingling spurs in sudden paroxysm of sudden fury. I will, by God above me, I'll scourge that pigeon-livered cur as long as I can stand over him. I'll flay him alive. Wow. <laughs> what is not to love about that? <laughs> and flame alive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, now, um, <laughs> where do we go? Uh, I was going to say, you know, all in all, a very male book, which is one of the things that um, you have written but moving from that towards the idea of maybe female characters and female characterization of which we've just heard. Well, they were very much in Bloom's head, we have to say, those ladies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. They're fa phantasmagoria of some description. Um, but it's all in Joyce's head, you know, so. I, when, when people w want to talk about female characters, I, I sometimes push back and say, well, what about the men in this book? They're yes. kind of weird, actually. Um, you know, that, that's, you know, could Joyce write women? I mean, could he, could he, could he write m men? <laughs> <laughs> Would you call Leopold Bloom? He's supposed to be a kind of everyman figure, but not every man does what Bloom does. Every man <laughs> might think about doing what Bloom <laughs> thinks about doing, but, you know, the, the, there is a distance between fantasy is in particularly in the Circe, uh, uh, you know urge and uh, engagement one might say decorously mm -hmm. so not all men are perhaps all men are potentially bloom like or all men are potentially dead i don't know that's a large statement it's a large statement about masculinity and i'm not going to make it <laughs> <laughs> but it, but but in in the way that people endlessly used to well not endlessly but you'd be asked about molly a lot in a kind of knowing way. Yeah. People might stand back a bit and see what you had to say. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, what these are, are kind of refracted uh, images from Joyce's marvelous mind. They're not, they're not real. Although all the, re the, 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 the amount of real people in it, we were just discussing this in the green room, there is a, a, a library, the National Librarian, mm. uh, Lister, was rung up by the BBC late in his life and uh, want, yeah, I believe you're a character in Ulysses. And he wrote back and said, actually, I am not a character in Ulysses, I am myself. Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So that was a, a very good answer. But I'm just saying, there's nothing sort of standard about the book in that you could say this tells us about, I mean, apart from the, the idea of that it, it, it opens possibilities for how we see either ma men or women. I suppose I think what's interesting about the women is that he's interested, at least, in the women that he writes about. Yes. Which you don't get a lot in male writers now or then. No, but it's a really, most amazing really generosity of, in women. of interest. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. not it's not just like they're not there to fulfill various roles. He's searching through them. Well, they're also there. Well, they well, and <laughs> as well the, as yeah, being that's the trouble of Joyce is that it, yeah. it's all the things. But there, he, I, you feel like he's searching those characters all the time. Like he's, he, they are not cre they are they do not exist pre-exist and and they're laid out. He goes through them the lines he's trying to find them, find the things about them to understand what and the questions that they're always asking themselves, you know that he's asking about them. And I think there's mm. something very different about that feel. And he doesn't, and I, d I, I don't you know, think he particularly writes women well, whatever that is supposed to mean, I don't know. But I think he is really interested in the inner lives of women. And that mm. is an interesting and well, he uh, allows them to be desirous. Yeah. Mm. 
which not wasn't really common at the time. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. So I know I have a special request here, oh. um, which is my favourite female character in this novel. I'm kind of out on my own at this. Well, maybe I'm not on my own in this. It's maybe it's all about. Oh, I love her too. Um, so my favourite female character is Mrs. Breen, who just yeah. she's my grandmother really, and. Um, so I've asked Anne Where did your granny us. grow up? Oh, um, Clambrassel Street. Oh, I'll bring down the accent a little. <laughs> 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 yeah. Did she? Yes. Did she? Yes. Yeah. It's all gone now, Clambrassel Street, really. Yeah, we, we, uh, Leopold Bloom is born on Clambrassel Street, mm. and uh, he isn't real either. But I'm sure your <laughs> granny was real. <laughs> she was. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bloom, how do you do? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Breen? No use complaining. How is Molly those times? Haven't seen her for ages. In the pink, Mr. Bloom said gaily. Millie has a position, a position down in Mullingar, you know. Go away. Isn't that grand for her? Yes, in a photographer's there, getting on like a house on fire. How are all your charges? All on the baker's list, Mrs. Breen said. How many has she? No other in sight. You're in black, I see. You have no... No, Mr. Bloom said. I've just come from a funeral. Going to crop, all day, up, uh, going to crop up all day, I foresee. Who's dead, when, and what did he die of? Turn up like a bad penny. Oh, dear me, Mrs. Breen said. I hope it wasn't any near relation. <laughs> May as well get her sympathy. <laughs> Dignam, Mr. Bloom said. An old friend of mine. He died quite suddenly, poor fellow. Heart trouble, I believe. Funeral was this morning. Your funeral's tomorrow while you're coming through the rye, diddle dum, diddle dum, diddle diddle diddle. Sad to lose the old friends. Mrs. Breen's woman's eyes said melancholily. Now that's quite enough about that. Just quietly. Husband. And your lord and master. Mrs. Breen turned up her two large eyes. Hasn't lost them anyhow. Oh, don't be talking, she said. He's a caution to rattlesnakes. He's in there now at his law books, finding out the law of libel. He has me heart scalded. Wait till I show you. Hot mock turtle vapour and steam of new baked jam puffs, roly poly. <laughs> Poured out from Harrison's, the heavy noon reek tickled the top of Mr. Bloom's gullet. Want to make a good pastry, butter, best flour, demerara sugar, they taste it with the hot tea. Or is it from her? A barefoot Arab stood over the grating, breathing in the fumes, deaden the gnaw of hunger that way. Pleasure or pain, is it? Penny dinner, knife and fork chained to the table. Opening her handbag, chipped leather, hat pin. Ought to have a guard on those things, stick it in a chap's eye in a tram. Rummaging, open, money, please take one. Devils if they lose the sixpence. Raise cane, husband barging. Where's the ten shillings I gave you on Monday? Are you feeding your little brother's family? Soiled handkerchief, medicine bottle, pastille, that was well. What is she? There must be a new moon out, she said. He's always bad then. Do you know what he did last night? Her hand ceased to rummage. Her eyes fixed themselves on, her, on him, wide in alarm, yet smiling. What? Mr. Bloom asked. Let her speak. Look straight in her eyes. I believe you. Trust me. Woke me in the night, she said. Dream he had, a nightmare. Indiges. <coughs> said the ace of spades was walking up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Mrs. Green. Yeah, she's great. But it's a moment of great sympathy in the book. But it, it, is, it, it is just lovely. It's such yeah. a nice encounter and, and not to harp on about Dublin, but it really is very Dublin. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some, so, so just some amazing standout lines, aren't they? I mean, the, he's a caution to rattlesnakes. I mean, that that's just, it just bounces off the page, doesn't he it? He has me heart scalded. He has me heart scalded. And he said the ace of spades is walking up the stairs. That's, that's a great, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, well, on that high note, I think we should um, open up to some questions. Um, not about the ace of spades, perhaps, but um, have we got any questions? We've got some roving mics wandering around and, oh, there we are, yes. Gosh, I can see the audience now. 
Um, who's going to be brave and ask questions? Yeah, I've someone up here. So there's, where is the mic? They're coming. Oh, yeah, here it is. It's just coming behind you. to uh, pick up something that uh, you said earlier on about Joyce not um, writing for himself, not following anyone. And it just made me think, because he, he, he was trying to write the ultimate realist novel, wasn't he? And people were trying to do that before. I mean, Diderot in mid-1700s wrote something, I think, called... Uh, this is not a story, and I think you know he. So the subject of trying to write realist literature was there, and I just wondered if you think that, you know Joyce was obviously aware of of the the, the 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 topic and people striving to try and write this and and then running with it himself, or maybe he was just it was just his idea. I mean, do you think that? He, was he, he did quote an antecedent in a, a French novel, whose name escapes me, that, that there was a stream of consciousness novel in French that mm. he had, had... Du Jardin. Du Jardin. Mm. Yeah. But that's... that's uh, Claire is probably best fixed to answer that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Dor <laughs> Dorothy Richardson was, you know, supposed to be the first person who wrote the stream of consciousness, wasn't it? I don't know. She's around the same time, and it's not as convincing... Dujardin is the one who I think does some stream of consciousness in French, and it's a little bit earlier. It's kind of a strange thing to want to do, put everything in a book. Yeah. Um, this question about realism, you know, I mean, realism is this huge 19th century genre, isn't it? And in a sense, Joyce wants to, to write the realistic novel, but he also wants to take issue with the form of realism. That's kind of what part of what the second half of the novel. I'm not supposed to answer the question. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be you. Yeah, I don't know. Um, have, we, um, <laughs> uh, uh, have we got a question from our online audience? Um, there's a question here about Dublin um, and whether you see Dublin differently because of reading Ulysses. I mean, does, does it play on your mind? Has it, has it ever played on your mind when you experience the city? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I walk along by the Joyce Tower quite often with my dog, um, and I pass Sandy Main Strand uh, on my way here today uh, to the airport, um, and, you know, whether the tide is in or the tide is out. I want to have a Bloomsday celebration where everyone closes their eyes and walks out on the Strand, because that's what happens in the first bit of that chapter in an octuple modality of the visible. He, Stephen cl closes his eyes and sees how far he can... He can go. We used to do that drunk on bicycles when we were students. <laughs> <laughs> Close your eyes and see how far. Uh, and so that would be my, my Bloomsday celebration. I'm going to walk out there. But I mean, there are the standard landmarks, you know, Finn's Hotel, where Nora Barnacle worked. The paintwork is still on there on Nassau Street. I don't think of it as often as I think of Oscar Wilde, who's around the corner. Mm. I mean, if you're, if you're asking. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, quite a lot. Um, but I lived in one of the houses that's mentioned in Ulysses, in 13th St. Kevin's Parade, which is mentioned in Calypso. It was a guy to whom money was owed for tea, called Moses Herzog. And in, 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 in Tom's Gazette, it's actually in Isaac Herzog, if I have it all right. And so there was a population in, in those streets. Um, and I lived there in 1985 to 86. And I didn't know anything about, I think I heard it later and it was kind of boring. Oh, I lived in a house in Ulysses and like, what, what, who cares? <laughs> um, it wasn't, but, but recently it struck me like a, a, with a jolt. I was, <laughs> I was living in a fictional house in an area of Dublin that has completely changed from your granny in Clam, Clam Brussels Street. Um, and that the, there was a population of Lithuanian, a Jewish Lithuanian population that shifted to America and elsewhere when, when Ireland got too Catholic for them, among other reasons. And, um, and I never knew that was there. And there it is in Ulysses. And, it, and, and it's there because, 
because Joyce is in Trieste, he wanted to open up the nationalist conversation. He wanted to make it less, less Catholic and homogenous. And it's there because he went away and he researched it back in. And, uh, and I find that extremely um, valuable and affecting. Hmm. Yeah, to make Dublin more plural. To, to, to make it multiple, yeah, to, yeah. to, to delight in variety and, and, yeah. and uh, yeah. Yes, less homogenous. Yeah, but it's more like when I'm reading the book to this online person, like it's always popping up like the Oval is, until recently was still populated by journalists and, and aeolists. And so you get, a, lot, a lot of it is just right, you know, it, it gets it right. Yeah. Um, have we got any other questions from the audience? We've gone quiet. Um, oh, is, is one here? Oh, and one up there. Um, sorry, just if, if we were stuck. Um, I'm doing an abridgment, uh, very cautiously and nervously doing an abridgment of Ulysses, which is a rather daring thing to do. And something that interests me is the difference between Joyce and Beckett in terms of the Catholic, uh, which is my background, and the Protestant and Anglo-Irish background of, of Beckett. I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on that, on the different sensibilities and in terms oh, of religion. Oh, yeah, sorry. Do you want to answer it? Um, I mean, I don't know. I suppose the two of them are yoked together by history, but I see them living in completely different houses all the time. I think, you know, the, the, I find, you know, Beckett is just so scourged, despite not being Catholic, and everything is so uh, mean and, and wonderful in its own way. But I, what I l love is the total kind of sensual abandon and self-indulgence of Joyce. Um, and it's, you know, so I suppose it's, I always find it interesting to read about all the time they spent together drinking and being pissed and Beckett, you know, transcribing for Joyce and what could have possibly been going on in his head when he was having those experiences and what it was like for him later to, to shear off that influence, having kind of wandered around under the weight of it and found his own kind of meaner, tighter, leaner self. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um. I was going to say, I saw a, Be a Beckett, I saw Happy Days in Irish on the Iron Islands a while ago. And I was listening to the Irish as well as, as uh, 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 um, I read afterwards, there was a, a, a few other Irish translations of Beckett. I wondered what was lost or gained by a translation into the language that, that came before, you know, prefigured uh, Beckett's uh, uh, use of English. Um, and actually, I didn't want to say it, but 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 the 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 colonial experience was was lost in that translation into Irish. So Winnie in Happy Days was not a kind of part of a, a of a an, an embattled and decaying ascendancy class. She was something much more uh, pious and <laughs> less affected. So all that kind of pretension was gone. All that sense of brittleness and loss was gone from the character. It was really interesting to see. So I think Beckett's Protestantism was up, was was key to what, what to to his characterizations, um, and uh, I don't know. That's also all. Also, the, the like the rejection of English for writing in. I think is you just could never see Joyce ever being willing to do that. Yes. I, I don't know enough about them, to be honest with you. No, well, yeah. you know, I don't know that much either, but I'm here and someone's asked, so I'm going to say <laughs> some stuff. <laughs> no, but I think you do. I think you do know more than I. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I think Joyce is so wedded to the richness of language, whereas Beckett, and, and to the Irishness of his language, of his English, whereas Beckett goes to such lengths to get rid of the Irishness, to get free of the Hiberno kind of, the pressure of that language, which has, you know, surrounded him, which is, and you see it in the early, not very good writing. Um, and you can see why he gets, it's an aesthetic choice to, to set, set himself out in, a, in an empty space. Whereas 
Joyce is always, like his feet are always on the ground, digging into the ground, growing into the ground and coming out of the ground, whereas Beckett, you know, creates this kind of, tries to create a va vacuum around himself oh. and around his language. Um, that I, I could just, I can't even imagine Joyce in that, attempting that. In all the things that he attempts, he never does that. I, I was on the brink of a theory there about uh, that, that Joyce is polyphonic and Beckett was a single note, but actually there's a lot of polyphony in Beckett as well. Yeah, no. yeah, there is, but it's there is uh, there is the the willful uh, disjoint between what what he comes out of and what he becomes. Whereas Joyce drags Ireland with him everywhere he goes. It does actually come down to that thing they tell writing students that either you're going to write more, 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 or less, less, and less. There's only two kinds of writers. <laughs> then with, <laughs> there's only two kinds. Maximalists and minimalists, you know, that if yeah. you sit at the desk long enough, you'll either have 500 pages or five. <laughs> you, you start with the same 20. So they had, yeah. a, they had perhaps a different kind of circumference. Yeah. <laughs> These are large yeah. questions. Yeah, they, <laughs> they certainly they are. Really are. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently verbatim, I think. In the yeah, case. I think but he upped it a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think he made them prettier. Yeah. But he couldn't see them, of course. The yeah, the Beckett text we kind of need, which I haven't read for about 30 years, is um, All That Fall. Oh, yeah. That's got a fantastic joke about the Irish language, hasn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it Beckett couldn't speak Irish. I know, but doesn't he say something? I don't something? think Joyce could either. No, no. I mean, but I they knew. Fuck them. Yeah. yeah <laughs> the, the, um, <laughs> Who were they at all? Yeah. I mean, yes. Let's talk about it. There was another question <laughs> in the middle here. Yeah. Um, Sorry to point. Um. Yeah, it was a bit because I thought there wasn't going to be any questions, but never mind. Um, I, I got the feeling that uh, from the part of Ireland I'm from, which is not Dublin, that he'd be considered a bit of an Egypt. And, um, you know, that may reflect on why many people don't find it easy to keep going. And the, the reason for that is if you look at the collateral damage from, for example, he, I don't think he ever bought a drink with his own money. <laughs> um, the Nora, the Lucia, Lucia, the daughter, the son, all seem to suffer significant damage from being related to him. Even his grandson, I think, was a bit of a, an idiot when it came to copyright and so on. So I wonder what the people think what it would be like to be related to him. <laughs> to, be, to be related to him. Wow. What would it be like to be related to James Joyce? Wealthy these days. Um, yeah, that's not an easy one, is it? I, I, mean, I don't think he was personally... Cruel. No, I mean, I think yeah. he was a very doting, loving father. I think he lived a very chaotic life because of his financial circumstances and because of his marital situation. And there were lots of reasons that they had very, his children had very chaotic upbringings and moving around. But by all accounts, he was very doting and particularly of his daughter and went to tremendous lengths to take care of her. Uh, when you know she started to descend into very serious mental illness and and was very broken by that experience of of what happened to her and did everything that he could, um, including enlist young who had insulted him uh, to help her. Which, as any writer will tell you, if someone insults your writing, <laughs> that is a very hard thing to overcome to ask that person for help, and and he did. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think whatever, whatever went on with the grandson, like, there's plenty of people who live very happily off the labours of forebears, and, and that is a whole other Egypt problem. Just, just, just the, his father wasn't any good either. And uh, no. so it started before Joyce's time. 
But I, I remember meeting one of, uh, one of the nephews and saying, oh, oh, my granny worked with your auntie. And he said, oh, that was so-and-so. And the look on his face was one of great difficulty. And um, he, he, he could manage the whole James Joyce's famous writer thing. But that whole family went through so much in terms of, and it's, in the, it's actually in Ulysses in terms of Simon, uh, Simon Dedalus not feeding his children, basically. Mm. Leopold Bloom sees them on the street. And Stephen is absolutely so angry with his father because of all of that. So it wasn't, I don't think Joyce was the monster. I think Simon was the, mon was the monster. Uh, it was the creative monster, except he wasn't really all that creative. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, so he came out of a very chaotic life where they were constantly one step away from getting put out the Everybody was dragged around the whole drinking time. and all the mad stuff. Yeah. So, so at least Joyce wrote a good book. At least he made two. something out of it, because that's a story yeah. that a, a million people can tell in a million countries and around the world for generations, is the story of chaotic family life. But he made something. And those that came after him profited, although they didn't make anything. So, you know. I, and then, you know, the, the whole monster reputation, not of him personally, but the book had a monstrous rep reputation after it. Yeah. That was also very difficult for everyone, that, that, that perhaps into the next generation, that it brought in a lot of money, but it was the dirtiest book in the world, and, it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Ireland only pretended to like it. Or only pretended, you know, but nobody read it or talked about the content. Well, nobody ever t t talks about the contents of your book in Ireland, do they? They just talk about how, you know, that, that it was in the shop, or <laughs> <laughs> that it was well reviewed, or, you know what I mean? You know, wouldn't, they wouldn't say, fuck, page 63. <laughs> what were you thinking? What were you thinking? It's, there's a, there is a kind of a privacy about between the covers, in, in, and I think that, that Joyce started that, actually, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't open the You'd thing get into it. conversationally. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think we've kept our audience some time. Um, are there any pressing questions coming in online that you are? Well, just there was just one more, um, which was um, was was Joyce convinced of his own greatness? I mean, did he would he have assumed that we would have been talking about it a hundred years later? Uh, would that have been his natural assumption? There are so many writers who who presume on their greatness, but he was he was the only one who was right just intersected, you know, with the thousand writers at the time who thought we'd be talking about him. He was right. The rest of them were wrong. Oh, mm. uh, yeah. <laughs> Is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they all probably thought they would be, that he was. Yeah. He got it right. Mm. I hope yours are talked about in 100 years as well, so. <laughs> yeah. He too. Um, well, I, um, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, and I want to go back not to Ulysses, but to Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and to um, some of those amazing statements at the end of that novel where um, Stephen talks about, in a kind of pretentious and fairly various way about being a writer, um, a few phrases that um, come, come back. Um, this race and this country and this life produced me, he said. I shall try to express myself as I am. And that is such a kind of, however you see it, it's such an interesting and resonant idea. Um, and then in conversation with um, the Dean of Studies, they have this very vexed conversation about you know, the English Dean of Studies about language and cultural nationalism and, you know, what it means to be a, a male writer. And he says, you know, the language in which we are speaking is his before it is mine. How different are the words home, Christ, ale, master on his lips and on mine? And so on. And then he says, my soul frets in the shadow of his language and we've had the word frets oh. you know pain that was not 
yet the pain of love fretted his human heart. So my soul frets in the shadow of his language. Well, I'm delighted that neither of you are fretting in the shadow of Joyce's language, but actually luxuriating. And on that note, I want to thank both of you for being so generous and for reading. And I'm going to ask Emer to read us out. got a section from a girl is a half one thing here. Says <laughs> 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 <Sit> well. <laughs> uh, right, I'm just going to read from the very end. Oh, and the sea. The sea crimsons sometimes like fire and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees at the Alameda Gardens. Yes. And all the queer little streets and pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens, and the jessamine, and geraniums, and cactuses, and Gibraltar as a girl, where I was a flower of the mountain, yes. When I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear a red, yes. And how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought, well, as well him as another, and then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I, yes, to say yes, my mountain flower, and first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. <laughs>